understood is called persecution. And this is kind of a strange word for those of us who live in evangelically driven America. Because we really haven't had to worry about persecution too much in our country. You may get mocked for your faith, but I've never known an American to get stoned for their faith. <laughs> Just doesn't happen too much. I, you know, I've heard of Christians being called names, uh, you know, goody two-shoes and religious fanatic and things like that. And when we used to preach the gospel down on K Street Mall in Sacramento, sometimes you'd have some pretty harsh responses to the gospel. You know, you talk to people about Jesus, and uh, Jesus is one of those names. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like an expletive uh, among those who don't like him, okay? We can say a four-letter word, and we go, ah, oh, and you say Jesus around people, and it's a five-letter word. <laughs> but... Um, you can talk about God, and usually it's not too offensive because everybody sort of has uh, some sort of a faith in God, unless you're agnostic or atheist. Uh, but typically speaking, you know, you have Muslims, which is one of the fastest growing religion, religions in the world, and you have Roman Catholicism, you have Protestants, you have all sorts of people who have used the name of God. But when you bring up the name Jesus Christ, suddenly you sound religious, don't you? And people think, uh-oh, this guy's a fanatic. And they automatically stereotype you with the religious right. <laughs> they are like Jerry Falwell or Jack Van Impey or Rexella without the makeup. So that's the thing that we, we get used against us when we use the name of Jesus. And that's sort of a, a type of persecution. But there was a different type of persecution that we really have never known in America. Some people in other countries, maybe some Mideastern countries and some Far Eastern or Third World countries, have known persecution and martyrdom. There's a good book out there called Fox's Book of Martyrs that I encourage you all to, to peruse. It's, it's, it's got some interesting stories about Christians throughout the ages who have died for their faith, who have died for the name of Jesus Christ. It's pretty intense. But we have a persecution in the first century that was not really, uh, that hasn't really been paralleled throughout the 2,000 years of Christian history. And Paul was in the midst of that. And Paul wrote this book of Galatians dealing with two types of persecution. They were dealing with persecution from the Romans who were beginning to despise this new sect uh, called Christianity, or the Christians, or as, as they used to be called, the Christians. And then they experienced persecution, the, the Jewish Christians experienced persecution from their own countrymen, as you see in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And the, all the epistles of Paul really have some sort of direct or indirect reference to that type of persecution from his own countrymen, the Jews. So I'm going to read this text here. It's Galatians chapter 6, verses 17 through 8, or 12 through 18. And you'll be able to see Paul alluding to this. As many as desire to look well in the flesh, these compel you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For they themselves, having been circumcised, don't even keep the law. But they desire you to be circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. But may it never be for me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision has any strength, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be on them and upon the Israel of God. For the rest, let no one give me trouble. For I bear in my own body the brands or marks of the Lord Jesus. Brothers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So it's clear that there was persecution coming from the circumcision. And the circumcision were just those Jews who had, who had rejected Jesus Christ. And, and embraced the Torah, and that became their mode of life. That became their modus operandi. It also became their way to eternal life. They believed that the law of Moses could save them. They trusted in circumcision, the physical removal of the foreskin, to give them eternal life. They got this on the eighth day after they were born. And they trusted that that was what determined their eternal life. They also trusted that their relationship, their biological relationship to Abraham, determined their everlasting life. 
And then, of course, they used their performance and their adherence to Torah living, obeying all of the commandments to give them eternal life. And Jesus brings a brand new message, which really wasn't new. You see it in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. The just shall live by what? Faith. The just shall live by faith. But they weren't getting it. In fact, Hebrews says they could not enter into the land because of unbelief. And Hebrews goes on to say, we which have believed have entered into his rest. That is, now we rest in Christ. It's not just a Sunday or Saturday deal. Christ is our Sabbath every single day because we have ceased. The Bible says, he which has believed in him has ceased from his own works. That is, we have ceased trusting in our works to save us. And so Paul was experiencing persecution from not just the Pharisees who hated Jesus, but also from a sect called the Judaizers. And the Judaizers, again, had crept into the church, the Bible says, and they had brought this dividing doctrine that basically said, okay, well, we're not fully Moses. We're believers in Jesus, but it's also Jesus plus circumcision. Do you see how subtle that could be? You see, if you were to come along to these Christians, which was growing rapidly in the first century, and you were to come along to them and say, look, Jesus doesn't count. He's not the Lord. He's not the anointed one. We should trust in Moses and the law to be saved. The Christians would say, no, no, that's false. We've got to believe in Jesus. So you bring something that's a little enticing. It it draws them back to their heritage. Boy, I remember circumcision. That was important. Yeah, the temple Maybe these Christians are wrong. Sure, Jesus is good, but let's have part circumcision and part Jesus. Yeah, that's it. That can save us. Part Jesus, part me. That's what you're really saying. To argue that your circumcision has to be conjoined with Christ in order to save you is to say, I have the power to do it. But what did we read in in Ephesians about two weeks ago? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the what? Gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What did Paul say? God forbid that I should glory or boast except in the what? The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where Paul had thrown away all of his other stuff. He had said, man, all the good works that I've done since day one, all the studying that I had done, studying of the law, he said he considered it as filthy rags and dung before God. And that now he looks at the excellency of Jesus Christ as his glory. So you can imagine the persecution. We're going to look first at a quote by a man named Tacitus.